My name is Kevin Zuber and I'm a professor at the Moody Bible Institute and uh, Tim Sigler is a, a good friend and colleague of mine and he's the one that wrote me, uh, invited me to uh, come and uh, be a part of this and uh, the topic was something that uh, we had discussed a number of times uh, as a result of a presentation I did at the uh, Lausanne Jewish Evangelism uh, meeting uh, a couple of years ago and uh, my concerns were there and I think Dan and Cynthia were there and some others and uh, so we've been a long time in uh, getting these dates together and I was here two weeks ago uh, to start things and last weekend I was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona for a conference that I had uh, obligated myself to way back flew out on Friday, flew back on, did the conference, flew back Saturday night, I was in my church Sunday morning so uh, uh, back here for this week and next week and we will be looking at the topic of dispensationalism and now I've heard the introduction to this twice in the in the uh, service as all the questions that I'm going to be answering and uh, that sent me into a slight panic today because uh, I don't think I can answer all of those questions in the entire semester's worth of work let alone a couple of sessions so uh, and I've been thinking about this and praying about this so what I'm going to do today is expedite the study and to just get the, the questions on dispensationalism and things. Tim and I talked, he said they need this, they need this, they need this, we, we, we need to talk about this, you need to answer this, way too much. Uh, and then based on some of the questions and concerns that we got last week, uh, I sort of kind of understood uh, where things need to go. So today I'm going to try and finish up uh, the notes that I handed out last week. If you have those notes, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine because uh, I'm going to be either one buzzing through. My students tell me this all the time. Your notes are completely unhelpful. Don't hand them out to us. <laughs> because I don't follow. A lot of people have notes expect that they're down like this looking at my notes and I deviate from them completely. The notes are supplements to the uh, things that I'm going to be uh, sharing with you. And maybe if there's somebody that's like a real good secretary or somebody that takes notes really well, you might want to just take down the outline and the basic points that I'm going to be dealing with today. That might be helpful. Uh, and then next week we're going to get into, uh, again, some of the issues that uh, sort of generated this. But the whole question of dispensationalism, uh, and that was the issue, dispensationalism, what is it, and uh, what does that mean in terms of our understanding, particularly uh, understanding the scriptures in relationship to the future of uh, Israel. So that's the, a broad sort of thing. So today what we're going to deal with is last time... I think I got through de dealing with definitions. I think, okay, that's that's kind of there. That's kind of where we went going around the horn on things. So I got definitions out of the way. So that I'm going to deal with three questions today. How's this for specificity? Three questions, and they're and they're very direct questions. The first is, and again, we're going to take this from the notes. We're going to ask the question: What makes a dispensation a dispensation? Last time we got the definition. This time, what makes a dispensation a dispensation? The second is, what makes a dispensationalist a dispensationalist? And we'll probably spend a little bit mo uh, more time on that question. What makes a dispensationalist a dispensationalist? And then the third question is, what makes a non-dispensationalist a dis non-dispensationalist? Uh, and the reason for that question is, is because I think one way or the other, I think the several questions that we got in the class last time was how in the world can they think this way? That is, the people that don't you know, read the scriptures the way we do, that see the future for national Israel, how can they possibly think that way? Well, we're going to show you that, or at least uh, start into that. And I know I won't, but if there's time, we all start into some of the issues that we're going to be looking at uh, next week. So without further, let's talk about what makes a dispensation a dispensation. As we said last time, uh, the dispensations are not blocks of time. Uh, and it really doesn't make any difference. If you know anything about, about this, uh, Schofield Reference Bible, the New Schofield Reference Bible, the Ryrie Study Bible, several other sources talk about the dispensation of innocence, the dispensation of human government, the dispensation of law, etc. For our purposes, and this will come next week, the most important dispensation is the millennial period. Uh, and we'll see that next week uh, in some, uh, get, get to that next week more or less. But how, how do these dispensations work out? They're not time, it's not segments of time. 
A dispensation is very, we saw last time, the definition is a stewardship or an economy or an administration of God. These are different ways that God administrates the outworking of his purposes. He's just administering them in a different way. How does he do that? Well, it's very specifically this. First of all, it's based on a revelation from God in two parts. It's a self-revelation from God. It's some point about revelation. Uh, Reynolds Showers, in his little book on uh, understanding dispensationalism, basically says uh, God comes with new revelation. Whenever you see new revelation coming, uh, that's generally the indication of a new dispensation. God's revealing more about himself. And that revelation is based on God's grace. It's always God's grace. God's grace is at the heart of it. God's grace is working. So God comes and reveals himself in a way that then provides for uh, humans, for, for people to understand and know his grace. Now, very, speci very simply, that revelation from God uh, and a revelation of his grace uh, means that man is responsible for two things. Number one, to acknowledge that revelation to acknowledge in such a way as to submit to it, that's really the same point, to acknowledge it and submit to it, and then to depend upon God's grace in that situation, to, to acknowledge what God wants, but then not to try and figure it out on his or her own, but to acknowledge that and, and to accept the grace that comes with that. What happens is, is that God reveals himself, <coughs> men either reject that responsibility, reject that revelation, and then try to manage things on their own. Uh, just, just to take you an example of this, this is right back to the beginning. What was the problem with uh, Cain and Abel? God uh, had clearly revealed, or clearly enough, had revealed that uh, what he wanted in terms of worship and sacrifice, and Cain came with something that he had done and expected God to bless it. Okay, so he wasn't wasn't accepting what God had revealed, and he was trying to uh, do his own thing and uh, thinking that God would accept that. Wrong, not good. Uh, the basic then uh, problem is, is that men fail to acknowledge God's self-revelation and fail to live with the provisions of God's grace that he's given to. Take another uh, larger picture, the uh, dispensation of the law. God comes and gives the law. Now, here's where a lot of people start getting confused, because a lot of people think, uh, and maybe even some Christians think, well, God gave the law in the Old Testament, you're supposed to keep the law, and if you keep the law, you're good with God, and everything's going to be fine, but if you break the law, then, uh, you know, he doesn't like you that much anymore, and it's all pretty much over. No, no, the law was never meant to earn a relationship with God. The law was always meant to enjoy a relationship that had been given by grace. God had made the promise to Abraham that his descendants were going to be a great nation. And God had provided redemption for the nation by bringing them out of bondage in Egypt. And then he gave them the law to a people that he had already made promises, to a people whom he had already redeemed, to a people whom he had already called my people over and over again. He gave the law in order that they may enjoy this relationship. The law was a gracious gift to enjoy the relationship, the grace-based relationship that God had given to the people. What happens is, is that even today we saw in the, in the, in the service, it gets turned on its head. Uh, I want to be the priest. And so we got somebody coming along and said, I think I get to be a better priest. So our Korah in, in uh, number 16 says, I want to do that. Nope, that's not going to happen. And all the way through the rest of the history of Israel, you see this over and over again. Here's God's law. Live under it to enjoy this relationship that the thing gets turned on its head and people start thinking they're gaining merit before God. And this reaches the epitome in the Pharisees. Pharisees are people that think that they're going to fulfill the law and thereby gain merit with God. And that's turned the law on its head. Rather than something that's helping them enjoy this relationship, it's something that they uh, think they're going to earn this relationship. Now, in that sense, and I may have left uh, a question in some minds last time, by the way, 
is do I think there's any continuing validity of, of the Old Testament law? Well, again, uh, I may have mentioned this last time, but I, I say it so frequently. Millard Erickson, a, a Christian theologian, says, you've got to understand the nature of the law is it's a transcript of the heart and mind and will of God. It's a transcript of the nature of God. It's a self-revelation from God. The law says, this is the kind of God we have. And if you want to enjoy a relationship with this God, this is what your life is going to be like. Uh, this is what you should look at, not in terms of trying to uh, earn it or climb up the ladder, but to love the Lord your God, to accept His grace, to depend upon His provisions for grace uh, and provisions for your life. And guess what? Your life is going to look like this. You're going to conform yourself. You're either going to conform yourself to the kind of life that reflects the life of God, or you're going to fall short of that, or you're going to transgress that, but if your life is right, if you submit to God the right way, accept this revelation, depend upon His grace, this is what your life is going to look like. Not as some onerous thing, not as something you've got to grind out, but something that's just going to reflect the fact that you're in a right relationship with God. And, and you go back and look at the Ten Commandments, not as something that's trying to keep you from having fun, you know, like what might these people be doing? Well, okay, the Seventh Commandment, that sounds like that might be fun, so I'm not going to let them do that. No, no. This is the way God made us. This is the way we're designed. If we live this way, we'll enjoy our relationship with God. It's when we fall short across that, you see. So there's, a, there's the dispensation of the law. A self-revelation from God in the law of himself. This is the kind of God we have. He's graciously given it to the people of God, to the nation of Israel. If they live that way, they're blessed. If they don't, they're not. And the epitome of missing it is in the captivity when they're taken even completely out of the land. Does that end the promise? Obviously not, because the promise was brought back in again. I mean, the point is the promise is always there. Any particular generation, any particular uh, generation of the nation of Israel could miss the enjoyment of this, but it didn't eliminate the promise of this. In the this is in the book, this is in Galatians chapter three, and we might have time to return to that later. In any case. That's what makes a dispensation. A dispensation is a self-revelation from God uh, in grace that presents a responsibility of man to respond to that self-revelation and to live in that grace. And if man fails in that, then God sends more revelation and more grace and invites man to live uh, under, those pro under those provisions that he's given. Quick if, comment. Yes. Um, uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the blessings that came from obedience mm -hmm. were in this life. Not you obey the law and you're going to gain heaven, but you obey the law and you won't have the diseases of the Egyptians, your, your cattle troughs will be full, your crops will succeed, mm -hmm. that you'll have blessings right. in this life. Yeah. It's both. It's both. It's both blessings in this life and it's blessings of eternal life as well. I mean, it's always been inherent there. All, all of those kinds of things have already been there. Uh, and, the, and the blessings of this life, and even the chastisements, the cursings of this life, all have the same end of to keep bringing man back to say, it's not working my way, I'm going to try and work God's way, I'm not going to do it on my own, I'm going to depend upon grace. Uh, so even the chastisements are gracious. Uh, for that. I mean, if, like you say to your children, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. They don't believe you, but uh, nevertheless, you go ahead and, and do that. So, it's there, there's a dispensation. It, again, a dispensation doesn't end, really. You know, well, we tried that. Again, some people have the idea that, well, God tries this. Let me try this. Well, that's not working. Let's try this. I'll try another one, and we'll try this. And that's not it at all. This self-revelation from God keeps building. This is the nature of progressive revelation. More and more revelation from God that leads, uh, is intended by God, not to make it more and more difficult, to, but to understand. Look, uh, it's like the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. I try everything else, and when you get done, what you're going to discover is obeying God and keeping commandments is the best way to enjoy this life that He's given to us and to have the promise that He's 
he's made to us in terms of eternal life. So I've given or I've followed uh, Ryrie and giving you some illustrations from some parables, but sometimes the, those are confusing. So let me move on to what I think is the uh, the uh, the issue that really then uh, I either you were asking about, and I think maybe the uh, organizers of our class are really wanting me to address, and that is what makes a dispensationalist a dispensationalist. All right. So a dispensationalist uh, is not a dispensationalist because. You know, we just want to stick our head in the sand and say, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is what I believe and I'm not really going to listen to anybody else. I really get that from the other side many times, is that they, you know, don't confuse me with biblical facts. I mean, my mind is already made up. Uh, you know, the point is, is that what we really want to say is, and this isn't like imposing something over the scriptures. <clears throat> this is something that we feel emerges from just reading the Bible and understanding the way the Bible uses the Bible in many cases. And we're going to see this. Uh, very pointedly. So, with each progressive revelation in each new dis dispensation, man's spiritual condition, his rejection of God's grace, his decision to push what I, a term I haven't used yet, autonomy, self-will, you know, live this life myself, I'm either going to earn a relationship with God myself, or I'm going to earn a place in hell myself, whatever it is, I'm going to earn it myself, I'm going to do it myself. This rebellion God keeps bringing more around. The chastisement is not working, is it? Why don't you try this more and more, this self-revelation? Now, where do we get this? Charles Ryrie, in his uh, very famous book, uh, Dispensationalism Today, Dispensationalism Republished Again in 1995, Dispensationalism uh, Republished Again uh, in this volume here, published by Moody Press, a name you can trust, says uh, there are three what he calls psychonon. Uh, I probably wouldn't even uh, mention that, psychonons, uh, but so many people have picked up on Reynolds Showers, and his little book has picked up on this. It, it's, it's just a, it's a term, I don't know who, where it came from. I think he, he picked it up from someplace else. That means, it's just a Latin term that means without which it is not. So these are the, these are the things that uh, Charles Ryrie said, this makes a dispensationalist a dispensationalist. And the first is a consistent distinction between the purposes and promises of God to Israel and those to the church throughout Scripture. Or simply, a distinction between Israel and the church. A dispensationalist sees a distinction between Israel and the church that's consistent. Now, again, some people say, well, I see a distinction between Israel and the church when there's nothing but Israel. But when the church comes along, that distinction goes. Well, that's, that's the distinction without a difference. Some people say, and you'll read this in uh, older versions, and you get an old, old King James Version and read the subheadings. It says the church you know, passes through the Red Sea or the church goes into captivity or something like that. I mean, this was so blended in people's minds. Israel, church, church, Israel, it just went back and forth. The dispensationalist says, no, there is a distinction between Israel and the church. Now, there are a lot of different ways that this distinction is made that... Uh, Frankly, we would pass, you know, go through scriptures and go through things in order to try and demonstrate this. But it boils down, in my mind anyway, to one very clear distinction. The nation of Israel is a nation, and the church is not a nation. Okay? And this goes clear back to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where God promises Abraham that he's going to make Abraham... Uh, a great nation. In fact, he made several promises there. Again, I'm not turning because this is what slows me down and I'm short on time. So you just look this up, follow me on this. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God makes a promise to Abraham that he's going to make his name great. Has God kept that promise? Uh, has Abraham got a great name? I tell my students, you know, Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ. We are now 2,000 years after Christ. And here we are at the unlikely place called Illinois. Uh, in, in this room, talking about Abraham still. Uh, you know, I tell my students, I, you know, four years after I'm gone from Moody, they won't remember my name at all unless they put it on a brick and put it out front. They'll be a step on there so often. Uh, I recognize that uh, my name is not going to be great. Nobody's going to remember it. We're still talking about Abraham. I think he kept that promise pretty literally, didn't he? Mm -hmm. and, he came, and he promised Abraham that he would. Uh, uh, through him, this is the third part of uh, he said, through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, I would say that that's true, and we would know that from 
from the standpoint of uh, the gospel that's gone throughout all the world, I think most of us recognize that that's a promise that's ultimately fulfilled. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed all the, all the, across the globe uh, through the promises that God made to Abraham that are fulfilled in Christ, and, uh, and then the gospel goes. But it's, that pro it's the promise of making him a nation that's the interesting part. Because what do you have to have to have a nation? Well, you really need three things. First of all, you need people. You gotta have people to have a nation. You also have to have land. Uh, you gotta have a land where the people are living. But having a bunch of people living on the land doesn't make them a nation, in spite of what the Native Americans kept saying, you know, this is our nation. Oh, you know, I mean, you gotta you gotta you have some have some organization, so it's a constitution. But basically there's the outline for a great deal of how the Old Testament flows. The promise of making him a great nation started with one kid. That's what Abraham was looking for. One. Okay? Great promise. You know, all the family, you know, they did like the stars of the sky and the sand. One kid. And how did that work out? I mean, well, again, the point is, is that there's just one child that's born to Abraham, and he knows that it's going to be the fulfillment of that. And the storyline through Genesis goes. And then the storyline of after you, you know, after Isaac and Jacob, and then the his descendants, and they go down to Egypt, and they're kind of incubated down there until God brings them up. This is all according to the promise of Genesis 17. Okay, I'm going to send them down there, I'm going to bring them back. Uh, they're given the law then, after they're redeemed, as I said, and then they go into the land. Okay, these are the things that, uh, that they were thinking. Now, the point here is, is that this, this, this understanding of Israel as a nation then, I mean, this is the, this is the interesting thing. Isn't that the storyline of the Old Testament? I mean, isn't the story of the Old Testament about the nation Israel? Mm -hmm. And the issues are geopolitical, right? I mean, they're, they're the kinds of things that go on in terms of the issues concerning nations, right? That's the story. God made promise to Abraham to see if this nation was going to see its, its, the promises as a nation fulfilled. And, and by the way, at one point along the line, God then comes and says, uh, okay, I'm going to add another codicil, I'm going to add another provision to this promise that I made to Abraham. I'm going to call that the Davidic Covenant. And the Davidic Covenant is that uh, David's going to have a son to sit upon his throne. So now we know the organization of uh, this, this arrangement is going to be through a, a theistic monarchy. And God's going to have a greater son of David. This is 2 Samuel 7. David's name is going to be made great. He's going to have a son to sit upon the throne. So God has made these promises, and then the rest of the story is, are those kings going to be worthy? Are they going to fill out? It's a geopolitical story. All right? Let's face it, the story of the Old Testament, if you just read it straight up, is about the nation of Israel. Right? Are the issues spiritual? Are the issues about Salvation are the issues about well, that's the question. Because I think uh, you all heard of Robert Louis Stevens, okay, not necessarily known as a great scholar, but he said it's amazing how these Scottish divines keep seeing the fulfillment of uh, you know all the promises of the Old Testament made to the nation of Israel in the churches in Scotland. You know, I mean, it's just kind of really strange. How does that all fulfill this? Or that uh, hymn that you hear sometimes, uh, the song Jerusalem, ever heard this hymn, like in the chariots of fire? The Jerusalem, but then Jerusalem, these green fields, these, uh, what? And they're talking about England. Uh, it's like, how is the promise made to God that he's going to have this kingdom that's going to have his capital in Jerusalem fulfilled in London, of all places? But this is the kind of thing that's done. Why? Well, because there is not a consistent distinction maintained between Israel and the church. By the time you get to the church, you have the church being the object of all of God's uh, you know, uh, concerns. And let's face it, as you're reading the New Testament, what are, the, what are God's concerns? As you're reading, as you're studying the book of Acts, what are God's concerns? I mean, what are you re reading about the book of Acts? What do you see in the storyline? What's the storyline? Who are all those letters written to that Paul's writing? To the churches. I mean, it's the church. The church is the focus in the New Testament. So as you're reading the New Testament and you see, you know, the concerns are, con well, first of all, about salvation. Now, it's not geopolitical. It's not geopolitical. It's about, not about this nation and its conflicts that go on 
with its neighbors and things of that nature. It's, it's about churches and the, their conflicts with false teachers and things of that nature. And the concern is salvation. The salvation is found in Christ. That's the concern. So uh, how, they, how is it then that we maintain a consistent understanding of the distinction between Israel and the church? You see, if you, if you, there's where the difficulty comes. A dispensationalist says, I'm going to maintain that consistency all the way through. If you're not a dispensationalist, you begin to start of looking at these things uh, with respect to what's going on in the New Testament and start making adjustments about what you read in the Old Testament. That brings up the second uh, of the three synchronon of Ryrie, and he says that there is a consistent system of hermeneutics. Now, if you're saying, Herman, who, you know, join the crowd, I mean, <laughs> it's just a matter of interpretation. Yeah. Talking about how do you interpret the Bible. Now, here's where it really gets muddy, because Ryrie labors the point. Uh, by the way, his third psychonon is the purpose of everything is the glory of God. I'll try to unpack that again a little bit more next week and uh, demonstrate. I don't think he's wrong, but I don't think he made himself terribly clear there. But let's, let's spend a few more minutes talking about hermeneutics and interpretation. Ryrie labors the point in his book, Literal Hermeneutics. And the other side, we believe, we believe in literal hermeneutics too. Okay, all right. Let's, let's plain, normal, straight up reading of the Bible. And they go, well, we believe that too. That's all we're doing. We're just taking a plain, normal, straight up reading of the Bible. And so we're scratching our heads. How are we going to express this? No, no. We, we mean that you take it the way you would normally take any kind of writing, just plain, straight up, and they go, yeah, we do that. But then they say, but you don't. You don't take it plain, straight up. I mean, you don't think hills have hands and they're clapping with joy, do you? You're not taking it plain and straight up. You know, when Jesus said, Herod, that fox, he wasn't thinking of, that Herod was small creature with a pointy nose and a bushy red tail. And he certainly didn't mean Herod that fox in the other way that we say Herod is a, you know, <laughs> today. I mean, it's a totally different sort of connotation. But we understand this. It's all poetic. It's all metaphorical. It's all by analogies. Uh, you see, we, we use this kind of language all the time. And they say, and that's how we're reading the Bible. We're reading it understanding the ways that you understand poetry and these kinds of things. And we scratch our heads again and go, yeah, but it's not poetry. I mean, it's not meant to be read that way. You can tell when it's meant to be read that way, and you know when it's not meant to be read that way. Right. And, uh, and the point is, is that uh, what makes you think this other particular way? We're trying to say, look, here's what it boils down to. A dispensationalist says, if you were standing there when Abraham was being told, I am going to give you this land, what was Abraham thinking? Oh, yes, he was thinking dirt. Okay, That's what he was thinking. He was, he was looking out at these various sorts of things and saying, this is what God is promising to me. Again, remember that passage in, in Genesis 15. God takes Abraham and says, just before God passes between the pieces to reintroduce the covenant, river of e Egypt, the river Euphrates, what what were you thinking about? What, what, we got this particular thing in mind. And uh, did I run through the names of the, uh, the, did I do this last time? The names of yes. the uh, people? Okay, so again, the point is, is that, you know, in Abraham, what would Abraham be thinking? He's thinking of this particular place, right? Yeah. Now, what would happen if somebody would come along and nudge him while he's just envisioning this great promise that God has given you, this geopolitical reality, and said, by the way, he didn't mean that, he meant Beulah Land. It, that's all heaven. Do you, do you realize that, Abraham? Abraham would have said, what? Huh? What? I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, the point is, is that God's made it pretty clear to David. Well, David, he doesn't mean that you're actually going to have a, 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 a throne in Jerusalem. That's, that's a throne in heaven. You know, you see, this is where you go in the book of Acts, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. You see, well, there's the, there's the fulfillment of that. And, uh, and, and you're going, yeah, but what would David have had in mind? What's David thinking? He's sitting there in Jerusalem, and he's thinking about his son, and this is what he would have been thinking. 
And, and by the way, you can just keep expanding that. What would Solomon have been thinking? What have the rest of these people been thinking? If you were to come and introduce all of these sort of spiritualized notions, or all these other, you know, well, this is metaphorical, or this is poetry. This is, these are real live people living in a real geographical, geopolitical environment. And God's making promises in them, and that's what's in their mind. And if, dispensationalist says, and if God doesn't answer his promises in just the way that was in the minds of the people to whom he gave it, then we have no reason to think that any of God's promises are going to be fulfilled in just the way we think they're going to be fulfilled. Right? The clear distinction between Israel and the church is this, that God has purposes for the nation. But the old dispensationalists put it this way, they are God's earthly people, uh, and the church is God's heavenly people. Not a very good distinction on the second end, but with the first one, yes, these are people, these are things that have to happen here. Now, there's a, again, we're going to talk about the whole program, and you're going to see uh, next time, uh, I'm going to sort of lay everything out in terms of uh, the purposes, the multiple purposes of God. But I want to switch here in the last few minutes and then uh, deal with the question, okay, well, why, does, why do some people not see that? How is it that they don't see that? Now, this is, I think, the biggest difficulty that we have. Because, as, again, as I just outlined it for you, as you read it straight up in the Old Testament, again, straight up, plain, this is what it says, they make promises, they're very literal, you should take them that way, what were they thinking? And then you have people coming along and saying, no, these promises are fulfilled in the church, that these promises to the nation of Israel are fulfilled not in... Jesus sitting on a throne that David would have recognized, but Jesus sitting on the throne of our hearts, uh, that somehow, some way, he's, he's, he's the king over everything. Right now, these other people will say things like, well, he's, the, he's, the, he's our priest, okay? And he, what he did for us as, as our high priest was what? He, he offered the sacrifice. The author of Hebrews explains this. He offered the sacrifice that is the fulfillment of all of what those sacrifices couldn't accomplish. He is, he's, he's our prophet. He is the one who's come. Uh, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son is in the bosom of the Father. He has revealed Him. Okay? And when He's our King, and they will say things like, and Jesus rules right now. And it's, I'm looking around, and I'm going, really? You mean, we don't have to have any more elections? Thank God for that. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, Jesus is ruling right now. He's ruling over everything. And then again, as I'm looking at everything, I'm going, oh, no, this doesn't look at anything at all like what the Old Testament was promising me. You know, I'm looking for the place where the wolf lies down with the lamb. You know, now if the wolf lies down with the lamb, the lamb in, lies down inside the wolf. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the point is, is that I, 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 I see a lot of those things in the Old Testament, but I'm assured by my by my covenant theology friends that, no, no, you're, you're way too literal in your understanding. You need to sort of understand how these things actually work out. And I'm, again, I'm mystified as to why they can do this. Well, actually, I'm not. And this is, in the last few minutes, this is the point I really want you to get. It's just so obvious to me, and sometimes frustrating. <coughs> it, 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 it's like they refuse to see it. But here's the key. Okay, again, I've, uh, Ryrie talks about hermeneutics, not specific enough. Another author uh, I'd recommend, Michael Vlock, who is a professor at uh, Master's Seminary, a little book with Dispensationalism, Essential Beliefs and Common Myths, uh, which is also republished in uh, certain chapters in this book, Christ's Prophetic Plans, edited by uh, John MacArthur and Richard Mayhew, published by Moody Press, a name you can trust. And, uh, and he says there are six elements. So Ryder had three, Locke has six, so I'm going to have 12. No. <laughs> no, I'm going to reduce it down to one thing, and this is what I want you to keep in mind. How can those people, how can people who, who do not see a future for national Israel, who do not see this, are they just blind? Are they willful? Are they just trying not to see it? No, here's the key, is that... They read the New Testament first, and then go back to the Old Testament. 
Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so they start with the New Testament. Now, I mean, again, I, I find that fundamentally flawed. I mean, the point is, is that, uh, let's see, start in chapter 6, and then they go back to chapter 1. I mean, and, and no one reads an Agatha Christie novel by reading the last chapter first. It sort of blows everything, doesn't it? I mean, the, the point is, is that, no, these people start with the New Testament, and then go back to the Old Testament. So they start with the New Testament, and they make one big mistake in that. Now, by, by the way, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt, it wouldn't hurt to start with the New Testament and go back to the Old Testament if you read the New Testament rightly. Okay? <laughs> so now this is where we start getting to pay, because then they say, well, we do read right. No, I'm trying to... I, the, 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 the point is, is that they ask the wrong questions of the text they're looking at. Okay? In the last five minutes, I want to look at Galatians chapter 3, very, 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 one very specific point to sort of illustrate this, because this is a very key point, okay? Is they start with the New Testament, and when they're reading the New Testament at certain key points, they ask the wrong questions of what they're reading, right? Now, you know Galatians 3. If you don't, you can go home, go home and read it. But in Galatians 3, we see Paul... Basically, don't forget the point of the book of Galatians. It's kind of like Galatians follows what we learned today uh, in the service, is that uh, you don't have to become Jewish in order to become a Christian, okay? You have to convert to Judaism first in order to become a member of the church. And Galatians is, is written to people who are being influenced by the Judaizers who are saying just that. You have to become circumcised before you can become a Christian. Okay, that was resolved in Acts 15, as you guys know. So, uh, but Paul's writing to the people in Galatia, uh, the churches in Galatia, the Christians there, who had started, who had started to fall into that error. And so he says, I'm, uh, "Who bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed? Having begun by the Spirit, and not made perfect by the flesh." I mean, the point is, this is going back to make the error. It was so often made in the Old Testament of thinking you could use the law to earn your salvation. Okay, there, there it is. Now, so he goes on to say things like, verse 7, Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith of Abraham are the sons of Abraham. That's Galatians 3, 7, and it's a very key verse for the other side. Those who are of the faith, who are, of the faith are the sons of Abraham. Uh, verse 14, In order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Uh, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So, very simply, the formula that's used, reading that text by those who are covenant theologians, the other side is, those who are the faith of Abraham, are the seed of Abraham. Those who are the sons of Abraham are sons of Abraham by faith. Okay? Is that true? Well, you got it. Give me some nods here because that's just what I read from the Apostle Paul because he can't deny that. Well, it's a, it's a, but here's, it's a here's, the, you know, here's, the, here's the issue. Okay? The question is, what question is Paul answering? If Paul is asking the question, what happens, what happened to the real, physical, ethnic, national seed of Abraham, if that's the question, where, where did Israel go, what happened to those people, and then you read this text, the answer is, they've just been morphed into the sons of Abraham in this wider sense relative to the seed, that in other words, if you ask what happened to national Israel, the question, the answer is, national Israel is not important. The faith, uh, faith uh, that Abraham had, that's what's important. Okay? But that's not the question that he's asking in this text. He's not asking what happened to national Israel. He's asking how do Gentiles get in? And that is the point of Galatians, right? And he's already said how they don't get in. You don't get in by being circumcised. How do you get in? You get in by faith. Now, there's, there's, so there's, uh, the, the question is wrong, okay? They ask the question, what happened to national Israel? By the way, where do you go in Paul's writings to answer the question, what happened to national Israel? 
You go to Romans 9, 10, and 11. Specifically, you go to Romans 11, 29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Right? They're not lost. And Paul even is saying that here as well in, in, in Galatians, if you will, because he says, you know, the law doesn't invalidate the promise. The law that comes 430 years later doesn't invalidate the promise that was made before. And he specifically almost in this very passage that they appeal to, makes it clear that, they, that the promises have not been invalidated. The, the question is, how do Gentiles get in? The Gentiles get in by faith. Okay? Now, by the way, ideally, every person in ethnic Israel will realize the full fruition of those promises by faith. Okay? If you wanted the fullness of that, but everyone who is of national Israel is, if you will, a carrier of the promise because there were generations in the Old Testament of unbelief and yet the promise was passed along through them. Paul makes this clear in Romans chapter 11. I am the fulfillment of that promise even though he knows the two or three generations ahead of him, they, they weren't believers in that sense. So there's a sense in which the fullness of what God intended is there. And I understand you see that fullness uh, when you get to the New Testament. What does that fullness consist of? That fullness consists of understanding that the Messiah is going to come and, and fulfill these multiple purposes that God had. Now this is where we're going to go next week. God's got multiple purposes. One of those purposes is restoring creation to where it's supposed to go, where God intended. That Who's that going to be fulfilled in? Christ. One of those purposes to have a greater son to sit upon the throne of David in this real geopolitical reality on earth. Who's going to fulfill that? Christ. Who is the one that's going to come and bring us all the blessings of a relationship with God now and for eternity? Who's going to do that? That's going to be Christ. But you see, these are multiple sorts of things. The, the other side, the, the point is, is that they want to squash everything down to just talking about salvation. You'll see me say do this next week and I'll explain this in more detail. They start with the New Testament. They don't ask the right questions. So therefore they come up with wrong answers. And I would say that they ask the, they ask the questions that they do because they know where the answers are going to end up. Okay, That's what they're really trying to do. We start with the Old Testament. We take it straight up. We, we maintain consistently all the way through the New Testament. And we discover that Gentiles get in on the promises, we're grafted in, as Paul says in, in Romans chapter 11. Uh, he, the author of Hebrews says, basically, we as Gentiles participate in all of the salvific promises, but that doesn't invalidate the national promises that God has made to the nation of Israel. They would say it does, simply. Yeah. So where, where is Israel and all the people of Israel supposed to be going, according to them? What happens to them? They are the church, or they are not anything at all. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they're just the... Uh, anyone that's of national Israel that doesn't come to faith in Christ is as any Hittite, is as any uh, Chinese, is as anybody else. I mean, it's an ethnic identity, but it has no, I mean, no continuing validity. That's all subsumed by the church. And how do they uh, explain away the 12 tribes of Israel that are supposed to reign? That's all metaphorical to them. Oh, okay. uh, doesn't that, uh, aren't they blinded by the veil until the last Gentile is called? Who, the Jews? The Jews. Well, I mean, Paul himself says in Romans chapter 11, I'm here. That's a part of, that's a part of the fulfillment of the promises. As God has always had his remnant, that's, what he, that's really the point of the first few verses of Romans 11. The remnant has always been there. And the remnant has always been characterized by those that, that know their ethnic identity and understand its, its uh, privileges and responsibilities, and they believe. The remnant has always been believing. Okay? And then remnant, Paul says, I'm a part of that. I'm, I'm just a part of that. So those who are believers now are part of that remnant. I, I, by the way, I should say this too. I don't believe that there's a an interregnum or a change you know, that, that when we get to the dispensation of grace that Israel is put on the shelf I think it's just as valid as it's always been uh, there's, there's no there's no sort of wait you guys wait until we get done here and then we'll get back to you no it's, it's still going on 
And there are some serious implications for that, too. Do you think people are confused not only by the fact that they're starting the New Testament uh, first, mm -hmm. but that the actual definition going throughout the New Testament talks about the church, the church, the church. And the way I always understood the way the word church was, the Greek is, it's just the gathering of believers. And that would have been right. Jewish and Gentile. Right, yeah. Whereas the church today, we think of an institution of, you know, denomination of just, is that throwing people Well, I think in part, Jews? maybe, yeah, in part. If you ask anybody, though, I mean, even the churches that are dispensational in terms of what they're supposed to be standing for, what validity is there to be a Jew today? Or in Paul's terms, you know, what privilege for being a Jew? What will they respond? Most of them, even dispensationalists. What advantage has the Jew? None. They're going to say none. Okay, what does Paul say? Much in every way, because those are the oracles of God, and I think he's got in mind the promises of God there. And, and this is the thing that just... Somebody who's an unbelieving ethnic descendant of Abraham is still a carrier of the promises. Okay, that's the advantage. They still have it. Okay, it belongs to them, even though they have absolutely, it's like some guy walking around with the deed to a particular property in his pocket and a bank account of unlimited funds, and he doesn't know it, and he doesn't live on it, and he doesn't participate in it at all. And if you pull it out and show it to him, he goes, eh. You know, there it is the problem because they don't, they're not believers, they're not carriers of it. So, okay, I got one more because I'm five minutes over. I can go seven minutes over, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will only go five, yes. So the promises of Israel, they're kind of like, uh, and William Tell, which are the grand pause before the 70th week. Well, again, I don't know that there's, I, I'm, I, I hesitate in terms of pauses or gaps or anything like that. I think there's, it's always been there. I mean, pr part of our difficulty is, is that we, regardless of who we are, we think that all of history had us in mind. <laughs> and, it, and each generation sort of thinks that way, you know. And, uh, and, they, and they say, no, it's not. It's, it's not. You're, you know, we're, we're all part of a, a much something, God's purposes are much bigger, and I just want to get in with God's purposes. I think the, the issue there is, you're going to see, and now I will stop with this, the multiple purposes that God has that the covenant theologian wants to squash down and say it's all about salvation. And by the way, we're in danger of doing that. Every time we go back to the Old Testament, and I'll leave you this, if my people are called by my voice, and that's not about the United States of America, okay? <laughs> that is not, and if I hear they quote it again, <laughs> So, you guys, it's warm in here. You're very patient. You've got great questions. Look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Let me close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the purposes of God, and we thank you that we know that your purposes worked out through uh, what we call dispensations, what we believe your word tells us, uh, is that uh, you are continuing to reveal yourself, and you are utterly gracious. And uh, your creatures, uh, men and women, have been uh, consistently rebellious until you work that work that we heard about this morning where the Spirit of God opens our hearts, where our heart, minds are open, and you do that work to make us see what's there in your word, the truth about Jesus Christ, and we can come to that saving knowledge. And we're grateful for that, Lord. We don't feel like we've got it over anybody else because uh, a man can receive nothing unless it be given him from heaven. And we just want to be faithful to the things you've made clear to us. Thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to study these things together. And we ask that you'll give us a great day uh, in you. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.